Hi friends, I'm Gio, and welcome to my channel. It's about gay fiction. What can I say? I like writing it. We're working on chapter 8 of Speeding. Ethan is an ambulance driver. He's gay, and he can't handle a lot of things around him. For a complete list of Ethan's 200 things, see chapter 3. Pete is an IT worker. He's straight and a closet hoarder. He and Ethan have been friends since high school. Because of recent circumstances, Pete is questioning his sexuality. He's also about to get evicted for health hazards caused by his hoarding. In trying to clean up, in trying to clean up, he triggered the boxes of his stuff to fall on him and trap him. He called for help. Ethan is having a hard time today. The patient he and his partner were transporting died mid-route. Then he got the emergency call from Pete. They rushed to Pete's apartment and discovered Ethan's worst nightmare. One last note. The little sounds you might hear in the background? That's my dog. She snores. Let's get started. Chapter 8 Ethan I had sworn years ago that I would never enter a place like this, a place as bad as my grandfather's. I'd broken that promise several times since I'd become an EMT. How could people live like this? I was breaking my promise now. My skin crawled and itched and I rubbed my arms. Piles and piles of old clothes lay vomited across the floor. Some of the piles easily reached my waist, and a huge one was taller than me. Dozens of old boxes were tossed about like children's blocks. Mounds of papers covered what I guessed to be the dining room tables and chairs. More boxes and clothes blocked the doorway to the bedroom. Dozens and dozens of trash bags were everywhere, and the place easily needed another dozen to gather up the trash. Everywhere I turned were more piles of clothes and stacks of newspapers, and magazines lined any and every surface, even if there wasn't a surface. The smell of the rotting trash turned my stomach. A cockroach scurried inside a leaking takeout container. I shuddered, taking a step back. The weirdest, worst day of my life began with a stack of newspapers. I can deal with almost anything, but not stacks of newspapers. The walls began to lean in. The air became close. The place was stifling, tiny. I couldn't breathe. My heart beat too fast. I gasped for any air. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Pull it together, I whispered, clenching and unclenching my fist. Everything was so close and tight and narrow, and all the boxes and newspapers leaned in toward me, touching me, suffocating me, smothering me. Breathe, damn it, breathe. Slow breaths. Don't touch anything. Another cockroach crawled across some papers. My arm twitched. Was that a cockroach running up my arm? Get it off. I brushed my sleeve, my arm, and shook my arm to get rid of it. There, in the shadows, what was it? Were those antennas? I had to get out of here. No, Pete was in here. Was that another cockroach? I brushed my shirt, my pants, get them off me. Little tiny black ovals were underfoot. Mouse droppings. The shadows crawled around me. Run, run, run. No. Pete's in here. It was happening again. Shit, not again. The boxes leaned. The ceiling was low. So dark. Too narrow to walk through. Turn side, turn sideways. Walk past the box. Don't look at it. The cockroaches swarmed me. I brushed them off, and I brushed them off, and I brushed them off. I couldn't get them off. My breath came fast, and fast, and faster, and faster. Run out. No. Pete's in here. Stop it, Ethan. Get in control. The cockroaches weren't on me. It's in my mind. That had happened years ago. It wasn't happening now. Pete's in here. The man I love. 
the man who kissed me last night, the man who called me for help. I can't enter this place, but I have to. Strickling legs ran through my hair, and something chittered, and its feet scrabbled across my skin. I brushed the cockroaches out of my hair, and again, and again. The walls closed in, and closed in, and closed in, and closed in, squeezing me out. My breath came faster and faster. Slow down, God damn it! slow down. Everything was so narrow, so tight, it was my grandfather's place all over again. Ethan, Tia patted me on the back. Focus, she ordered, and led me to the only clear space. Old sweaty blankets covered the couch, and smelly takeout containers surrounded it. Beside the couch was a dusty coffee table, Pete's dirty TV, another blanket brown with sweat stains, and a small pile of clothes. They reeked. Oh my God, there were clothes everywhere. A cockroach, was it real, ran past. I stomped it and stomped it and stomped it and... Breathe, Ethan. There's nothing there. We're going to need your help for this, Tia shouted. My best friend was a hoarder. No wonder we always met somewhere else. Pete's a great tenant, pays his rent on time, and hasn't missed a month. But he has a serious problem. Linda told Officer Gillespie. I didn't want to, but I gave him an eviction notice last week, and he's been cleaning all morning. If something happened to him, it's my fault. Pete, we're here. I brushed another cockroach off my shirt. Was that another one? I brushed it off my clothes and swatted a second one. Or was it a third one? Tia grabbed my hand. Calm down and focus. It's in your head. Eviction notice. I fought the panic. Everything was trapping me. Pete, answer me, I screamed. I couldn't be professional. I couldn't think. This was my best friend, the man I loved, the man who kissed me yesterday. I looked at Tia and shouted over the rising panic inside me. Tia, help. They're everywhere. What do I do? Tia gave me a small smile and took both my hands. Look at me. Game face, Ethan. Here's what we do. The faster we find Pete, the sooner we get out of here. Ethan, the paths are wider going back to the kitchen. You check that way. Braddock, you've got the bedroom. I'll look around the boxes. Her face had hardened, as had Braddock's. I tried to mimic them. We were professional now, or I tried to be. What's wrong, Tia? Braddock said. It's like PTSD or a panic attack. Ethan's a claustrophobe, Tia said. Tell you the story later. Braddock clapped me on the back. We can't do this alone. Pete needs you. Right. I took a deep breath, turned sideways, and took a tiny sideways step into the narrow path that led to the kitchen. I had to do this. For Pete. I inched between the stacks of boxes and garbage bags and piles of clothes. My fists clenched closed and my arms remained tight to my body. I can do this, I whispered. Don't touch anything. Something moved. A mouse? A cockroach? Something touched my hair. I slapped about my head. A cobweb. The trip to the kitchen seemed to stretch miles. Pete needs me. Stay in control. Dirty boxes. Dust everywhere. On my skin. I bumped some boxes. Would they fall? I have some rubber gloves in my pocket. I snapped them on. The dim light caught little eyes peeking out of a garbage sack. Something moved in an old takeout container. Did something crawl in it? Sit rep, Ethan, Tia ordered. Something made of glass crunched under my foot. Careful, guys, there's glass, broken glass. We're walking on broken glass. Sit rep, Ethan, Tia ordered. I took a breath. The air smelled dusty and moldy. I'm in the kitchen. Piles of dishes and clothes and garbage bags. They're everywhere. And mouse droppings and broken glass. Tia, he's got stacks of magazines here. And papers. Lots of papers. They live in them. Millions of them. They swarm. Is Pete by them? Tia asked. No, I said. Then avoid them, Tia said. Something smelled like vomit and damp wood. Columns of boxes reached to the ceiling. Even in the kitchen. 
Boxes of books had spilled across the piles of clothes and broken beer steins. Boxes, more boxes, more papers. God, how many did he have? There were a lot of things I couldn't figure out what they were. And more papers, and papers, and papers. Another cockroach. I stomped it. And another, and another, and another. They were climbing on me. I brushed them off. Ethan, it's in your head. You're safe. Braddock and me are here, Tia said. Ethan, Braddock said. Where's the bathroom? By the kitchen, I said. Check it, Braddock said. I had to move a couple of boxes to open the door. I slipped and fell. A box had spilled hundreds of papers onto the floor. Papers, more papers. Ethan, breathe, Tia said. I couldn't do this, but I had to do this. A dish crunched underfoot. Why hadn't Pete asked for help? Ethan, don't go quiet, Tia shouted. The bathroom had boxes in the shower and clothes on the floor, and the wall seemed to warp, and something crawled on the wall. The counter had takeout containers and empty bottles of shampoo and old smears of bar soap and gray powder that must be old razor dust, and I walked on undershirts and nice shirts and slacks and shorts and socks and boxers and a thousand empty toilet paper rolls and dozens of paper towel rolls and more soap and an empty air freshener and mouse droppings and was that a dead mouse? A huge cobweb hung from the light and the toilet lid was up and some creature ate rotted brown vegetables from a takeout container and I looked inside the toilet. The vomit rose in my stomach. I swallowed to keep it down. Pete's not here, I yelled. I would not touch anything, and I'd sanitize my boots with bleach when I got home, and I'd have two showers, and I'd wash my clothes, maybe all of them. The stacks of boxes leaned and moved and shifted towards me. Were they about to fall? I have to get out of here. Was that another cockroach? That shadow under the counter? Did a mouse run in it? Oh my god, I can't do this. Ethan, are you okay? Tia ordered. It's so dark. Everything is so, so close, I said. I made it back to the kitchen. A garbage bag had spilled. A flurry of mice were eating something on the floor and scurried away as I entered. I focused my breathing into short gasps. Tia, it's so dark in here. Gillespie, open the blinds. Get us some light. Find a light switch, too, Braddock ordered. Ethan, you're done up there. Are you okay? Pete's not, not, not back in the kitchen, and the bathroom's back here, but he's not there either, I said. Ethan, you're not a rookie. We get the job done no matter how we feel. Get your game face on. That's an order from your senior partner, Tia said. Yes, ma'am, I said. Gillespie opened the front blinds, or tried to. The cord broke. Pete, can you hear me? Linda said from the door, and reached in to fumble for a light switch. A stack of old mail was in the way, so she pushed the stack over and got to the light switch. The lights came on. Pete, I'm sorry, this is all my fault, she said. A ceiling fan covered in spiderwebs and dust began to slowly whirl. Tia sneezed. I'm coming back, I said. What kind of chocolate do you put into your brownies, Braddock said. Powdered chocolate, milk chocolate chips, and usually white chocolate. I usually use more milk chocolate chips than white so it will be more chocolatey, I said, edging my way down the narrow footpath to join the others. I kept my fists clenched and my arms tight to my side. I needed the fresh air, I needed the light, I needed to get out of here, but not without Pete. Chocolatey, that's not a word. Get the man a dictionary. I can't get into the bedroom, Braddock said, and the boxes over here are still standing. Pete's not here. Could he be somewhere else and I misunderstood? I said. Braddock stepped out from a pile of clothes. Ethan, Pete called you on his phone, so call him back. I had reached the living room and I closed my eyes. I could run out into the air and light and be free of this nightmare. Instead, I pulled my phone out. I dialed, hoping that Pete wasn't buried in this mess. You're doing fine, Braddock said. Tia, do you see Pete? My phone connected. A very faint, muffled ring tone came from the dining room. The place with the most fallen boxes. The place Tia was at. 
Found him. Ethan, Braddock, get over here quick, Tia said, and pointed. I stumbled through the mess and stopped. I couldn't breathe. My eyes teared, and I stared at Tia, then at the floor. How could so much stuff fit into so small a space? How many boxes did Pete have? The walls closed in even further. I wanted to scream and yell and run away. The ceiling fan blew dust everywhere. Tia sneezed again. I brushed another bug off and another and another. Sometimes, during the long shifts, Tia and I told each other everything. I had told her what had happened to me years ago. I had told her how much Pete meant to me, that I loved him. Tia had told me to talk to Pete, tell him how I felt, and I did last Wednesday. I froze in place. I couldn't be professional, not now. I wiped my hands on my pants, and wiped them again, and wiped them again, and wiped them again. I had to get the cockroaches off me. No, that was years ago. It's not now. I just let my hand open and close. How many boxes were on Pete? Ethan, breathe, Braddock said, placing a hand on my shoulder. Keep it together, Tia said. It's happening again, I said. I couldn't focus. My legs started shaking. Pete's left basketball shoe stuck out from under the boxes. He'd fallen backwards and landed face up. His foot was in an ankle-high white athletic sock, but it wasn't white anymore. His shoe, his sock, his ankle, the little bit of leg I could see were red, blood red, and the clothes on the floor underneath him were bloody too. Dispatch, how long until the others get here? We're going to need help, Braddock said into his comm. We're already here, Bacon said, leading the way inside. Xavier, Jesse, Harry, and Draper were behind him. Can you believe how bad this place stinks? Who lives in this sewage dump? Xavier said. We should burn it. Shut up, Xavier, Braddock said. The rest of the team got in line behind Tia and Braddock and shifted boxes. What's wrong with Ethan? Did the smell turn Mr. Perfect into a psycho wimp? Xavier said. Shut up, rookie, Braddock said. Then he looked at me. His eyes narrowed and his lips flattened. Ethan, either we babysit you or we save Pete. Harry, get Ethan outside, sitting down, head between his knees. I looked at Tia for some kind of help. Tia picked up a box from off of Pete and set it behind her. You heard him. Go. Harry led me outside to the walk, and I sat down. I still shook. I still felt the bugs crawling on me. I still smelled the smell. Bacon, Harry, and Jesse stepped outside and saw me. Bacon stretched and shuddered. I get what you're feeling, Ethan, and I don't blame you for freaking out. Harry knelt next to me and said, You and Pete, are you close? Tia and Xavier wheeled the stretcher out with Pete on it, strapped to a backboard and wearing a neck collar. My best friend was pale and unconscious and had dried blood on his leg and face. Pete called me for help and I had been useless. Xavier stared at me and whispered to Jesse, What do we do about Psycho? Did you see the way he freaked? Why did you put me to work and send Ethan outside to sit down? Knock it off, rookie, Harry whispered. I ignored Xavier and spoke to Harry. Yes, Pete and I are close, but not that way. Pete's my best friend, but he's straight, I said. You're gay? Xavier yelled. You just figured that out, rookie, Bacon said. Ethan's so much like my little brother, it's funny. The only difference, my brother can't cook anything without setting off a fire alarm. Give us a minute, guys, Braddock said, and sat beside me. Feeling better, Ethan? A little, I said. I've seen you crawling through cars to help save somebody. How come you were fine crawling under the bus the other day? Braddock asked. It was open on all sides, so I could get out if I needed to, I said. Severe panic attack, trapped, can't function. I bet you avoid elevators too, but you're fine in an ambulance because it has all the doors, Braddock said. That's my apartment too, front door and a balcony, and plenty of room. 
I have to have space, I said. Braddock sighed. In Pete's apartment, you didn't have room to escape. That sounds like claustrophobia's stepbrother, claythrophobia, fear of being trapped. In a way, it's worse and could really cause problems in our job. Ethan, I'm sorry about this. We're friends and we've worked together for two years, Braddock said. There's a but in that sentence, isn't there? I said. But this isn't the first place like this we've dealt with, though it might be the worst and it won't be the last. I'll have to mention this to the chief. He needs to know, Braddock said. I hugged my knees and stared at my dirty shoes. Something sad caught in my throat. I should have expected this. Braddock was only doing what he had to, and he was right. Saving lives came before our job. If we came across another place this bad, would I be able to go in? If it hadn't been for Tia and Braddock, would Pete still be trapped? Dispatch interrupted my depressing thoughts. 341, code 2, ambulance required, patient transfer. As soon as you have dropped off your current patient, you'll be taking a patient to Vegas. Tia was sitting in the passenger seat and read the screen. Non-urgent transport of Mitch Parker to Vegas for spinal surgery. Ethan, it's the man you pulled from the bus last week. Psycho Wimp pulled somebody from a bus? Xavier asked. Out from under a bus, rookie, Draper said. This is TF-341, Code 2 acknowledged. We are securing our current patient and heading to Long Ridge. Code 1, Priority 1. 341, Code 1 acknowledged, dispatch said. This is the busiest Sunday we've had for months, Braddock said, getting to his feet. Ethan, you're driving. Xavier, you're assisting. I call shotgun, Tia yelled. Let's get Pete to the hospital. Lock and load people. Braddock helped me stand and I walked to the driver's side of the rig. I had been completely useless on this assignment and I couldn't even rescue my best friend. What would I tell Pete? Thanks everybody for dropping by and sharing the chapter with me. If you want to see Ethan's 200 things, check out chapter 3. We'll see you in a week. Oh, there goes my little dog snoring again. I hope you enjoyed. Peace.